Responsive layouts allow you to design experiences that look good across all kinds of screens. It's almost like the interface knows how to react when it senses a change in its digital real estate. If you want to reach maximum users, you have to make sure that your interface is intelligent enough to nudge itself to make the best use of available space. As a designer, there's one concept that is extremely important while designing responsive apps, and that is the concept of constraints. In this video, I will be explaining you in detail as to how constraints work on Figma. How do you simulate multiple breakpoints in a single frame using a free plugin called Responsive? If you're just starting out, don't worry. This video is really logical. It is about understanding a very foundational concept. Don't worry if things look very technical. After you finish watching this video, make sure you complete the two Figma playlists I've shared in the description. This video is recommended for both beginners and advanced designers. If you're coming here for the first time, don't worry, watch this entire video and make sure that you see all the playlists that I've mentioned in the description below. During the entire session, I will be mentioning a few shortcuts. In fact, if you see my cursor, as soon as I click on something, you'll get to know if it's a left click or a right click. If I type in something, let's just say I select this frame here and do shift 2, you can see what keys I've pressed on the bottom right corner. So there's absolute transparency, there's no way that you can miss anything. It'll be great if you can either document everything that you learn on a piece of paper or just open a Notion document because that is what I do. So without wasting any further time, let's get started. So in my opinion, constraints are one of the most powerful features that we had on Figma. It slightly takes more time, but in the longer run, you end up saving a lot and a lot of time. Let's just discuss why would I even use constraints. I'm going to hide my interface and enter a full screen mode. You can do this by pressing command backslash. If I select my frame name which is on the top left corner and press shift 2, I will fit my frame. If I press N, I'll shift to the next frame. If I do shift N, I'll hop back to the previous frame. I'm telling you this because this really helps in handoff as well. So right now I've selected a frame so you can see that there's a, there's a bunch of options on the right side but if I zoom out and if I press the A key, you would realize that the right side menu changes and there's something called a frame and just beneath frame there are a bunch of recommendations that Figma is giving me. Let's just say I want to make something for an iPhone or for an Android. So it has a bunch of options and it also states the resolution on the right side. Now a while back we only had a few devices, right? But now that we have all kinds of screens, it's very important that the product you make is intelligent enough to change itself when it jumps from one device to another. So your application should work seamless on an Android, on iOS, on web, all kinds of platforms that are available there. How does that even work? So we're going to pick a case study here. Let's just assume that I am making an app which would sell my design courses. And I really want an interface where I can tell people what are the courses I have, what kind of people are eligible to watch this course and a small description about it. So let's just understand, let me minimize my video here. Let's just try to understand a very, very interesting concept of frames and groups. So this is a card that talks about my course and there are five core elements in this entire card. There's a picture that adds a little bit of branding to the entire thing. There's a label that tells you whether this is applicable for a beginner or an intermediate. The title of the course, a small description and something known as a CTA, which is a call to action. If you click on it, you'll open the course page. Now I have arranged all these elements using a frame on the left side and using a group on the right side. When I stretch this, you'd realize that things are okay when I reach the midsection, the middle point. But when I go beyond a specific size, when I vertically stretch this card, you would realize that all the elements inside of my frame sort of stay pretty consistent, whereas stuff in my group is not at all consistent. It's almost like a bunch of things just shifted randomly, whereas when I look at my frame, it's almost like the elements knew how to move, how to react as I scaled the size. 
So the use case is that this could be for a narrow screen, this could be for a very wide screen and this could be basically for an iPad. There are many ways to use these cards. So let's jump right into it. When you make a frame on Figma, you'd realize that there is something called constraints on the right side. I've made a shape inside this frame. As soon as I select this frame, there's this menu on the right side. I've taken a screenshot of this entire menu and pasted it here. Let's just get rid of all the extra details for a while. Just remove this so that we can focus on what is truly important. Now there are two things, two properties that I have to set when I'm working with constraints. The first one is the horizontal constraint. The second one is the vertical constraint. Let's make a new example. I'll make a frame, make it slightly gray, put a rectangle centrally aligned on the top. Let's make the radius as five. Let's make it. And also don't worry if you're like, oh, what is this guy doing right now? You don't have to learn anything else apart from the concept of constraints. Cool. So let's just say this is a button on top of my screen, right? And I'm happy with this. But what if I end up stretching this screen horizontally? What if I end up stretching this screen vertically? How would the button respond? I don't really want this button to stay on the top left corner. This is where constraints come in. So let's just say I've selected my frame inside the frame. I've selected this rectangle. If I set my horizontal constraint as left and right, it basically means that this part of my card and the edge of my frame would always stay on an equal distance. This distance will always stay the same. Now, if I duplicate this frame and increase this card, you would realize that the button is responding. Now, let's just say I decide to make this button stay in the center, not really stretch, but stay in the center. I would toggle the left and right and make it a center horizontal constraint. Once I do that, now when I stretch my canvas, the button always stays in the middle. Now, there are many things that you can do with this. Let's just say I want this button to stay on the top in the left corner. So if I make the horizontal constraint as left and then take a copy and stretch it horizontally, the button stays to the left. If I take this button again, make the horizontal constraint to right, I'll make a copy of it, stretch it again, and you'd realize that the button stays on the right. So basically you tell the button that dude, if I shift things around on a vertical scale, on a horizontal scale, you need to know where to move. So this is about horizontal constraints. Now let's talk about vertical constraints. I'm going to delete this file, select this frame, enter here. So if you guys have studied uh, Google's material design, you would know that there's this concept of a fab button. When you open your Gmail, there's this CT at the bottom right corner. Now, no matter how I expand my screen, this is by default an iPad screen. No matter how I expand my screen, the button would always stay at the bottom right corner, right? It always stays in the bottom right corner. If I expand it from the top left corner, nothing happens. But as I expand things from the bottom right corner, it actually responds. Now, you would have noticed that when I'm expanding things, the text and the column, this row of entire data is working pretty well, but there's this gradient here, which is not working well. How would I fix that? So let's just try to understand what are the constraints placed on this button right here. On a horizontal level, we have it on right, makes sense because we want it to stay on the right. And then on the vertical scale, I would set it to bottom. Then there's this gradient which is getting all messed up. Let's figure out where that file is. Also, when you select a specific frame, if you press return, you would select all the files inside it. If I do shift return, I would go one level up in the hierarchy. If I press tab, I would go to the next frame. If I select this frame, press enter. Now I am inside the frame. If I press tab, it'll select the first thing on the top. If I press tab again, it'll jump to the next screen. Tap, 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 tap. 
If I do return tab, I come to the top. If I press enter and then tab, I can select a specific screen. So let's check which file is that. Oh, this is the side ramps file. Now you can notice that the horizontal constraint is left and the vertical constraint is top. But in reality, I want this gradient to stretch and fit to all the four edges of the screen. So I would set the horizontal constraint as left and right and the vertical constraint as top and bottom. Now when I stretch the screen, you would realize that things become pretty cool, right? And the same constraints are applied to this top bar. The same constraints are applied to the bottom. And that is why these things are responding well. Now, let's just say I have a course page and I've made it for my iPhone. I've made it for my iPad. I've made it for a desktop. This is the course page. Technically, the kind of data that you see on all these three devices is the same. So this front end, which is my screen, is basically fetching data from the back end. If you really watch closely, you'd realize that there's a single image, there's a single title, there's description. The points are same, but the visual dynamic, the way that I have rearranged stuff on my digital real estate varies from screen to screen. So if I take this iPhone and I realize that, hey, I want to check how it looks on an Android, which is slightly wider. Can you see how elements are behaving well? Let's just try to break down what all constraints I used on this specific file. So I'll duplicate this by holding the alt key. Let's check these elements one by one. So at the bottom is the info box. The constraint is left and right and vertically at the top. Now, why would I do that? Because if I scale these things, if I scale on a vertical height, it doesn't move. But check this out. If I scale from the top, this thing is moving. Moreover, there's also a concept of nested framing, but that is a slightly complicated concept. We can pick that later on. Now for the small little poster, I want this poster to stay in the center. And if I increase the width, I don't want it to stretch, right? Because let's just say I switched the constraints from center to left and right. When I stretch this layer, you'd realize that the poster also stretches because I've set the constraints to left and right, but I don't want that kind of a behavior. I want these things to stay constant. Whereas the background, which is these, this blurry layer actually, it's actually a bunch of effects applied. I've put the image, I've put a linear gradient, then I've put a blur effect. I want that to stretch from edge to edge. So I have made that as left and right and vertically as top and bottom because I want the overlaying poster to stay intact, but I want the blurry effect to stay constant. So what I'll do is I'll delete all these files, select this poster, keep it center. Can you guess what would be the constraint for this button? Horizontally, I want this button to stay in the middle. It should never increase in width. So the horizontal constraint would be center. And when we talk about the top constraint, you'd realize that there's something called hug contents. Don't worry about this. This is a concept from auto layout. If you have watched the Figma playlist, you'd have some idea about how auto layout works. If I click on it, I'd realize that, oh wait, I can finally see my top constraint. So I've put similar constraints. And when you give these files to the developer, you have to be very clear about how these elements would react. But sometimes even the developer gets confused because it's very difficult to visualize how elements would stretch from one screen to another. So I have a really, really interesting plugin, which is called responsive. It's a free plugin. One of the best plugins that I ever, ever saw. I got to know about this plugin from Figma's playlists. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of valuable information in Figma's office hours playlist. So what I'm going to do is when I, when I click on my responsive plugin, also, if you've never installed a plugin, you can get them from the communities panel on your Figma. I'll select these three screen sizes and put them in my input frames. Cool. And I'll make a test frame. This is where I would test all these things. I would delete everything, make this as my test frame and input this in my responsive frame. Now check what happens. As I scale down, it actually shifts from an iPhone to iPad to a computer. And can you imagine how this is happening? So at a certain breakpoint, it has selected my MacBook Pro frame. As I go beyond a specific breakpoint, it switches to the iPad screen. 
and then after that it switches to my iPhone screen. So pretty pretty interesting tool. It's actually amazing if you ask me. I have touched this topic very briefly because I wanted you guys to truly understand how constraints work. Now I know that you cannot really understand the entire use case of how constraints work in a single video, but my intention was to just give you a glimpse of how responsive layouts work when we use vertical and horizontal constraints. Now that I've introduced the concept of constraints to you, I want you to go on YouTube and learn some stuff on your own around the topic of responsive design and constraints. There is a bunch of stuff coming up. I have just picked a one topic for this time. There's a bunch of foundational concepts that we will be covering in the upcoming eight to nine videos. And after those eight to nine videos, when you're done with your basics, when you truly understand the foundations, we will be covering all kinds of amazing tips and tricks and optimization techniques that really help me accelerate my career as a UX designer. If you like the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so that you get to know when my next video comes because you have to stay in touch. Put your doubts in the comment section so that I can answer them. This is Ansh Mehra. I am a UX designer at Zuttle.com, which is a virtual events hosting platform. If you want to know more about me, you should definitely check out my first video on this YouTube channel. I also run a podcast called Take It Easy, where I talk about life, design, career, and much, much more. With that, we'll end this session. Keep learning, keep designing awesome stuff, and keep telling interesting stories. I'll see you next time. हेलो हाँ भैया मैंने एक्चुअली आपको व्हाट्सएप किया था बट आई थॉट फोन ही मिला लू मुझे एक्चुअली थोड़ा स्ट्रेस हो रहा था हाँ हाँ अंश यार मैंने देखा था तेरा व्हाट्सएप है आप आप कहीं बाहर आए हुए हो क्या नहीं नहीं तू बता ना भैया जरा पाँच रुपए वाले दो जेल पेन दे दो देख भाई जो सैलरी तू एम कर रहे हैं ना वो मिलती है डिजाइनर्स को पाँच साल के एक्सपीरियंस पर अब तू विशो को ही देख ले ड्रॉप आउट करके डिजाइन सीखा उसने और मंगला में धक्के खा रहा है एक बात बता दो तीन बटन बनाने के तुझे कोई क्यों पैसे देगा इतनी बढ़िया सैलरी मिलती है कोटर्स और डेवलपर्स को इतनी सारी कंपनीज आ रही हैं तुझे फालतू का रिस्क उठाना क्यों है हाँ मैं आपकी बात समझ रहा हूँ बट यू एक्स डिजाइन इतना भी सिंपल नहीं है ना भैया अब इतने सारे ऐप्स बनेंगे तो बिना अच्छे यू डिजाइनर के कहाँ से काम चलेगा अभी तो डिवेलपर को थोड़ा एक्स्ट्रा दे देंगे तुझे क्यों इतनी सैलरी देंगे ये बता मेरी बात मान अपनी कोडिंग कर और साइड बाई साइड डिजाइन करता रही दिक्कत क्या है मैंने ट्राई किया मुझसे बट मुझसे हो ही नहीं रही ना कोडिंग अब मुझे तो एक्चुअली फिल्मों का शौक था कोडिंग करना तो बिल्कुल ही ऑपोजिट हो गया अब मुझे यूएक्स डिज़ाइन अच्छा लग रहा है और मुझे लग रहा है कि इसमें यू नो स्कोप आ जाएगा मुझे बस आपसे ये एक एस्टिमेट लेना था कि सैलरी में बहुत ज़्यादा डिफरेंस तो नहीं होता ना देख भाई मेरे हिसाब से किस्मत अगर बहुत अच्छी हुई तो एक बहुत अच्छे डिज़ाइनर को तीस पैंतीस हज़ार मिल जाते होंगे बट बहुत रेयर केस में और वो तो भी मैं मैक्स बोल रहा हूँ भैया मेरे पापा तो बहुत ज्यादा एक्सपेक्ट कर रहे हैं तेरे पापा बीटेक से हैं क्या नहीं यूएस डिजाइनर हैं? नहीं तो उन्हें कैसे पता कितनी सैलरी मिलती है नहीं मतलब पेरेंट्स को थोड़ी तो एक्सपेक्टेशन होती है ना तो एक काम गीक्स फॉर गीक्स के पेपर करने शुरू कर छह सात महीने में इतनी जावा तो आ ही जाएगी की तुझे बिगिनिंग में अनपेड इंटर्नशिप मिल ही जाए इतनी बढ़िया कंपनीज आ रही है प्लेसमेंट में लास्ट ऐसे डबल कंपनीज आई है यार I think this is the best time to learn coding. चलो मैं देखता हूँ फिर चलो ठीक है हाँ चलो ओके बाय बाय